So, anyways, now that I've basically gotten so many of the dinosaurs created, I am going to start excavating this entire area in order to make the pen for the Allosaurus. And I don't know why I'm doing this really random and unconvincing accent. And we've got a severe thunderstorm warning coming in, and that is going to cause a whole bunch of hostile mobs to spawn. Hostile morons like yourself should spend more time reading books instead of blasting them. <laughs> it has been way too long since I've watched the Indiana Jones movies. Oh, speak of the devil, here they are. Come here, come here, you little pest. You know, Mojang, I don't want to tell you how to do your jobs, but when the hell are you guys going to morph the zombie babies? Baby jumbies. Because these little bastards are fucking tedious. And they are broken as hell. Ugh. I think this is a good spot to break ground. Also, The Force Awakens sucked. I mean, that's so weird. Is that, like, the best way to put it is that The Force Awakens does not age well, and it's certainly not going to age well, and it hasn't aged well at all. It's a, It was a real spectacle to see in the theaters, and I remember leaving the theater saying, that was all right, I guess. And then I started talking myself to myself about it. I started thinking about everything that I just saw, and even though it was kind of good, it wasn't really as great as everybody was saying. I definitely don't think that it need, that it deserved the near flawless ranking on Rotten Tomatoes, and I don't think that it deserves any of the praise that it's getting from, like, the fan base and whatnot, especially because, like, it's literally the exact same thing that happened before. And because of that, I honestly hate it more than I hate the prequels. And the thing about it is, I didn't start hating the prequels until, like, uh, roughly, I think, uh, about maybe eight years ago. Like, I honestly thought that the prequels were okay when I first saw them, mainly because I was a little kid. I was 12 when Revenge of the Sith came out. I was, um, let's see, I was 9 when Attack of the Clones came out, and... 1999, I was, um, I think I was six, yeah, I was six when, uh, Phantom Menace came out, so maybe it's because I watched them at a younger age and I didn't see anything glaringly wrong with them. I know that they have their problems, but I don't think they're as bad as everybody makes them out to be. I think that they're just misunderstood, and the fact that they basically squandered a lot of potential. But... I think that there's a difference between a movie that doesn't really live up to the full potential that it could be, and a, and a bad, and being a bad movie. Like, for example, there are some movies out there that I think really could have been better if they had lived up to the full potential that they could have been, like the recent Dragon Ball Z movies, The Battle of the Gods and Revival of F. If they had basically just allowed themselves to live up to the potential of what they could have been, instead of being as mundane as literally every other Dragon Ball Z movie that came before them, then they honestly would have been much greater than they are, but I wouldn't necessarily say that they're bad movies because they didn't do that. They're still certainly watchable. I mean, the revival of F was kind of lousy, but at least it's better than the Super Arc. But a movie that I will genuinely say, like, does neither, it neither lives up to its full potential and is a bad movie, is the Power Rangers movie that came out last February. Or was it March? I honestly don't care. But basically speaking, yeah, it was in March, but... Basically speaking, that was a movie that I had wait, been waiting for a long time. Whether or not it was a good thing that this movie was, that a movie like this was going to happen was debatable, but still, it's like... After all that waiting and all that build-up, this is effectively what we got. <laughs> and <laughs> the thing about it is, is that people online are saying that this gave the characters actual character development. How? 
seriously, answer me that. How is it that anything that this movie did can even remotely be called character development? Because it's not development, because these aren't characters. These characters are, st are, char are stereotypical caricatures of what people think teenagers are. And I honestly cannot believe that I'm saying it, but the original series had did this better than the movie did, because at least with the stereotypical caricatures that the teenagers were as teenagers back then, at least they were positive stereotypes. They weren't exactly real characters, but at least they were likable. The characters that we have in this movie, they are likable, but they present themselves as if they're not supposed to be likable, so... Um, yeah, your character's fucked up, and you did bad things, but you didn't really convey that you guys might be legitimately bad people, so why are you guys just putting yourselves down the way that you do? So, and plus, the fact that they kept going with that Billy Cram's, cr Billy Cram's crayons up his butt joke, that was so cringeworthy. Oh, and did I mention the fact that this Power Rangers movie that basically is rep it's a symbolic icon to like a whole generation of viewers, it starts out with a joke about a teenager jacking off a bull. That, uh, literally, it has a joke with one of the teen with a teenager basically grabbing a bull's penis and jacking the bull off. I am literally not joking about that. I honestly think that anything that was even remotely good about me back before I saw this movie died the moment that they made that joke. I'm legitimately serious. That joke killed whatever decency and goodness there was left inside of me, and now I'm just this horrible walking embodiment of bitterness. I am Rita Repulsa. And I find it so weird, because, like, anyone who personally knows me knows that I had my own ideas for what the Power Rangers movie should have been. This movie basically made Rita into the main antagonist and the final boss of the series, because, well, the, f wait, the main antagonist of the movie, because that's what she was in the series, and I can respect that, I can get behind that, but Maya, but they also made Goldar into the final boss, and... My idea was kind of a reverse of that situation. I wanted Goldar to be the main antagonist of the movie and for Rita to be the final boss. What I mean is that the Rita basically like wakes up and comes back to life and basically just uh, in this movie, all of her actions are completely independent of the Rangers to the point where you sort of forget that she's even in the movie. So. Basically speaking, there was no real interact, no real reason for the Rangers to interact with her whatsoever, and unfortunately, that happens in the series as well. Rita doesn't near interact with the Rangers as much as she should have, and I feel like in the pilot episode, Rita gets freed from her prison, and the basically it, it's pretty much never mentioned again. It happened way too easily in my mind, so. My idea for the movie was that Goldar would be the main antagonist of the movie because he and the other members of Rita's gang, like Squat, Babu, Finster, and Scorpina, because you gotta have Scorpina, she is an underrated character, and she's Goldar's wife. <laughs> but basically speaking, oh, I wonder if I'll keep this cave down here, like give the Allosaurus like, a little enclosure to hide himself in. So that he doesn't have to feel like he's on the spot all the time. But I'll keep the feeder definitely out in the open, so where he has to come out to eat. But anyways, my idea was that the movie would be all about Goldar's attempts to find Rita's... The capsule that Rita is imprisoned in. I'm not going to call it a dumpster, because... Let's face it, it's not a dumpster. It's a bin or a barrel, but not a dumpster. So his efforts all throughout the movies would be to try and find the capsule, which has been taken back to Earth by the astronauts instead of opening it on the moon like a bunch of idiots.
And so, basi and basically the Rangers would stand in the way of him doing that without really knowing what they're doing. As far as they know, Goldar is here to just take over the planet, and they don't exact. and Zordon hasn't revealed his true intentions yet, so, basically speak. So basically speaking, that would be the reverse, and near the climax of the movie, Goldar would finally get his hands on the capsule and be in the process of freeing Rita, so that would basically like lead us into the final battle of the movie. And it feels much more legit, because I mean, in the Power Rangers movie that we got, Angel Grove, instead of being a big, bustling metro metropolis-like city, it's... Um, it's basically a mining town. There's a gold mine there, and I think the mine has been shut down, but basically, because of the way Goldar was updated, you basically knew exactly what this movie was going to do with the fact that Angel Grove is now a mining town, that Rita was basically just going to raise Goldar, out, raise all the gold out of the mine and use it to build Goldar and whatnot. So we basically all knew that that was coming. So my question was... Why did it take so long to get us to that point? Why couldn't Rita just immediately go to the site of the mine and start bringing up all the gold out of the dirt? Why did she have to waste time going around town looking for sources of gold when she was literally standing on a literal gold mine? <laughs> it's funny. The people who wrote this movie basically are not supposed to be making the same mistakes as the original Power Rangers series did, because they're supposed to be giving further thoughts to the implications of what they're actually doing. Instead, they are actually making the situation worse. They're literally not, they're not thinking about the implications of what they're saying or doing at all, and this is literally making it dumber. We got our Dilophosaurus. One of the earliest carnivores. <laughs> it would be cool if this game had, like, a uh, an achievement that said one of the earliest dinosaurs when you, like, uh, hatch a Dilophosaurus. The weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fear, the spell of Minnow would be lost. The Minnow would be lost. Why am I singing the theme of Gilligan's Island here to you? It's cause I'm bored and I have nothing to say. So anyways, my point is, is that like, why she was literally standing on a literal gold mine. The climax of this movie should have happened way earlier, back before the Rangers were even ready, and thus is given the explanation as to why having your entire plot dedicated to the Rangers having to prove themselves to be the Power Rangers, even though they were chosen to be the Power Rangers, is literal bullshit. It's a literal contradiction, because, one, they say... Zordon and Alpha say that the power coins, which aren't really coins in this movie, they're more like melted pieces of gold with glowing stones inside of them. Basically, it's like what Jeremy from CinemaSin said, they're basically a ripoff of the Infinity Stones, hook, line, and stinker. So, basically speaking, that's they weren't chosen at all, they're not really... They're not really coins, and the, the coins didn't choose the rangers, the rangers found them and pulled them out of the rock, so they... There was no ch so they're not really the power coins aren't really coins. They didn't actually choose the Rangers, and the Rangers weren't actually chosen anyway because they have to spend the entire movie proving that they were the right people to be chosen, even if they were even when if they actually were chosen, then they would already know that these people were worthy of being the Power Rangers. Plus, I gotta say that I knew Brian Cranston as Zordon was going to be a problem, and I absolutely hated him as Zordon. Not basically because Brian Cranston is the best actor, but one, you could tell that he really did not want to be doing this, that I have a feeling that he was only doing this because one, Power Rangers was the series that technically gave him his start, so I feel like him being Zordon for this movie was kind of his way of owning up to that, acknowledging that, and playing honor for it. Other than that, maybe he was doing it for like his because it's, he got the offer and his kid was like, Oh, Dad, it would be so cool if you got to play Zordon. Please play Zordon, Dad. Please, please, please. 
but you could basically tell that he didn't give all that much of a damn about the character that he was playing. He was just basically reading off of a off of the script or prompt or whatever, and it's like, okay, I'm done for the day. Please pay me. Please pay me so that I can go back to answering my Breaking Bad fan mail. But ultimately speaking, they had a lot of good ideas with Zordon, but monumentally bad ideas with him as well. So... And I'll get into why that is in a minute, but one of the biggest problems is that he definitely sounds like he doesn't know if he should be take. He definitely sounds like he's taking the dialogue seriously, but not seriously enough. And ultimately the problem is just how mundanely he played a character like Zordon of Eltar, because I know that this is basically like a trope that's supposed to like not be liked amongst people who listen to a story, but... Zordon basically is the archetype of the wise man, the wise character in the series, because he's the mentor figure to the Power Rangers, he's their leader, he is the wise, semi-all-knowing leader who's meant to basically t help the Rangers with their problems and help them realize who they are, help them understand what they are and what their job is to be Power Rangers. Throughout the series, Zordon is the guy that you went to when you needed answers, because he was the guy who had all the answers. At least, he seemed that way most of the time. So, basically depicting Zordon the way they did with this movie it just felt sort of wrong to me. And especially, like, the scene where Zordon is introduced. I mean, not the scene with the flash-forward, where he's fighting the final battle with Rita in the Cretaceous period, which, I might add, is almost directly lifted from the Power Slash Rangers fan film. Yeah, you remember how I'm always saying that that movie basically stole literally everything from the fan base in order to make this movie? Even from me, because I sent a treatment of the movie into Saban and I never got a reply from it, but they clearly got it because they clearly used some of my ideas for this movie. But, <sighs> moving on, the introduction with Zordon being the big floating face in the wall instead of the big flying floating head in a tube, well, basically, uh, it just, um, just felt so wrong with me because it felt like Alpha basically kind of, uh, held him hostage, because Zordon was supposed to die, and it seemed like Alpha was keeping him alive, almost like he pretty much kind of in only, he's basically put into stasis. I mean, it's kind of like what Team Four Star did with their World's Strongest movie about how Dr. Cochin put Dr. Wheelow in cryostasis, and Wheelow is now effectively powerless because he's a brain in a jar who can't really do anything for himself. He can't stop all these bad things from happening. He's only just being forced to witness them all, so... Ultimately speaking, that's what I kind of thought, but also it was kind of disturbing how there was also a subplot about Zordon basically bringing himself back to life. and ultimately made Zordon kind of... Um, a bit unlikable, kind of, because he was basically kind of using the teenagers to bring himself back to life. But also, you guys basically just let turn the morphing grid into whatever you want it to be, whatever's convenient for your story, didn't you? Because I guarantee you, the morphing grid cannot bring people back to life. That is just ridiculous. If the morphing grid could bring people back to life, then... That literally cheapens Zordon's sacrifice from the end of Countdown to Destruction. And plus, how is this movie going to handle its sequels with that information? They'll never be able to recreate the magic of Countdown to Destruction because it literally will mean diddly squat. Because Zordon will just be able to pass through the morphing grid in order to come back to life. And plus, since he's already dead, he's not really, he doesn't have a life to sacrifice anyway. Anyway, if you're wondering what that rustling is in the background, I actually brought some food home with me, and I was supposed to have started eating it over an hour ago when I got home, but instead I decided to do this. So, just going to take a little bite. That's all. Ooh, I love the squeaking sounds that you babies make.
You know, I really do wonder sometimes, because I basically have no identity on YouTube, and I want to do a variety of things. I know that people who talk about movies on YouTube can also talk about video games and whatnot. They can also play video games, have dedicated channels to that, so... I'm just basically wondering, could I actually just do a review of the Power Rangers movie and then start reviewing movies? I mean, other people on YouTube do it, and sure, I wouldn't have my own kind of presence or personality to reviewing movies, but leave a, leave a comment, comment down in the comment section below to see if you'd like to hear me talk a bit more about movies, because I could literally go on about the Power Rangers movie for days and why it was terrible, and give objective criteria as to why it was terrible, so you know that I definitely know what I'm talking about, so... But, if I can make one last comment about Zordon before moving on... It would basically be, because of how soft-spoken Brian Cranston was as Zordon... Granted, I sort of imagined what Zordon would be like as kind of a soft-spoken, gentle, gentle sage kind of guy, but... Ultimately speaking, I still imagined him having the reverberance and booming voice that he is supposed to have, because Zordon is the wise man, and he has to have a voice that grasps your attention. He has to have that big, booming, larger-than-life voice, because that's just what Zordon is. I imagined him having a kind of softness to it, but one that kind of would resonate with you. The sound would just make your body tremble in a kind of way. Rangers. You must act swiftly. The planet is in great danger. <sighs> ah, there's nothing better than the taste and the nice, cold, refreshing crisp of product name and description withheld. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, so... But, that's enough of me talking about the new Power Rangers movie, so I'm gonna talk about the old Power Rangers movie now. <laughs> I know that, basically speaking, a lot of critics on the internet have lambasted the movie, but honestly, I kind of got a soft spot for it. I feel like it was the first attempt to sort of legitimize the Power Rangers while still keeping true to the spirit of what the show actually was. Cheesy one-liners, mm, cheesy one-liners, cheesy villains, kung fu, and a whole bunch of wire work. Plus unconvincing ro giant monster robot battles, so... In a way, they succeeded, except they weren't doing all this ironically. They were supposed to be doing it unironically, so... <laughs> but basically speaking, I know that some critics have a problem as to Ivan Ooze's character being the villain of the movie, because uh, why not make the villains of the movie the villains of the show? Well, that's because the show was actually going on. Dilophosaurus. Female. And a male! Holy shit! I'm getting... I'm four for four. Holy crap, this is the one pen that didn't have the... didn't have a feeder in it, so... Here. Your Dilophosaurus is full. In case you're wondering why the other pens like this have, like, the the feeders over here in the glass section, it's because I wanted the ba basically these windows and the maintenance totals to be able to see the dinosaurs, so I wanted the dinosaurs to basically come close to where you could get a good look at them. But since I have that feeder over there, I think I'm just going to go get some meat and fill it up. No, you stay back. You stay in there. Good boy. Nice boy! Nice dinosaur! I thought you were one of your big brothers, you're not so bad. <laughs> you're not so bad. What do you want? What do you want? You want a food? Look at me! I just fell down a hill, I'm so good, I don't have any food. I have no food on me. I have nothing on me. <laughs> that scene was funny. You know, I really kind of wish that someone would interview Wayne Knight just to get him to talk about, like, Seinfeld and then talk about Jurassic Park because I feel like Wayne Knight is one of those under underrated 
Jurassic Park characters, because it's kind of like you know that he's Dennis Nedry, but then you kind of take a moment and realize that Wayne Knight was in Jurassic Park. I mean, it's kind of like Samuel L. Jackson. You kind of got to take a step back to re remember the fact that Samuel L. Jackson was in Jurassic Park. And I think it's because he was so young, he still had hair and whatnot, he was wearing glasses, and he was always smoking, that I couldn't really recognize him as Samuel L. Jackson. He looked like a completely different person. So, yeah. I think I've let up meat here. Let's see, I think three stacks should do it. Oh, great. My chicken feeder is overflowing. I didn't want the feathers. It's the one thing that I really wish I could get rid of the feathers, but it would basically... It would basically need me to, like, double the size of this already cumbersome and... <sighs> annoying machine. Just to, like, make a kind of filter that would filter out the feathers just to destroy them, and sometimes the filter doesn't work, so... Fuck it. Go fly like an eagle to the sea. Fly like an eagle, let my spirit carry me. Me to fly to them free. Let's check on my dry sores real quick. You having a good time? Ooh, this mo this mob is basically the uh, getting happy. So the the bubbles they work. <laughs> In that case, let me go check on the brackies to see if their mood has increased. Not this one, and as you can see, it's clearly standing here, starving itself. But they are definitely getting bigger. What are they, three days old? Well, the compies are basically out of it because they basically are nocturnal. He is a real compisaur. He sleeps with his eyes open so that he can still watch the feeder. Theropod. Here you go, guys. Soup's on. Wow, that didn't fill it up all the way, but oh well, right now there's only two of them. How much can they eat? Mm -hmm. He said, as the, he said, and then three days later they basically ate everything in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but basically speaking, back to the Power Rangers issue. The thing about it is, I basically saw the Power Rangers movie as basically not being a represent it not being like a rebooted origin story that's supposed to basically re-explain the Power Rangers and show exactly how the show works because if you wanted that why not just go watch the TV series itself now to me what I saw it as is pretty much how I saw the Dragon Ball Z movies as well basically kind of non-canon what-if stories that basically show that there's a new there's always going to be a new villain that shows up and they cause problems and they're so powerful that they they would even be a problem for the current villains to handle and so that's ultimately why I kind of like Ivanus as a character and I honestly cannot believe that he is Belloc from Raiders of the Lost Ark I mean seriously like how did he go from that movie to this movie <laughs> Oh, 
I love that galloping sound that it makes. Chopping, get, mining all these blocks at once. Well, let's think about what this video has basically accomplished so far. It's featuring me complaining about a whole lot of things, while in the background I'm basically going over all these dinosaurs and whatnot. We've hatched a lot of dinosaurs in this episode. I mean, I basically wanted to dedicate at least one video per dinosaur, but I realized that that would be slow moving and I just don't have the time or the attention span to actually do it that way, so we did it this way instead. And so basically, like, we got our comp significance, we've got our Dryosaurs, and now we've got Dilophosaurus, the first dinosaurs on our tour, at least when we bring them over into the real Jurassic Park, not this Jurassic Park, even though this is Jurassic Park, but it's not the real Jurassic Park. This is basically Jurassic Park San Diego here. <laughs> Synonymous with gluttony. I'll always have a turkey or a ham. Stop singing that song! You know that people say that The Simpsons have gone down in recent years? I would agree, but at the same time, I disagree because, well, even though The Simpsons quality has dipped because it's been a show that's basically been going on for like 30 years now, ultimately speaking, I still think that The Simpsons can be good. And every now and then, they release a new episode that has a really great idea, and they actually work with it. Like, for example, one of my all-time favorite Simpsons episodes actually came out just a few years ago. It was called The Book Job. The Book Job was an episode that parodied the Ocean's Eleven movies while pointing out how, basically, the... I guess you could say unethical or shady business practices that come with the young adult literature writers about how all the about how s these young adult books that are coming out are basically just written by focus groups and whatnot and how they basically just invent the actor the they invent the author for like the audience to get behind and sympathize with, usually because of a tragic backstory, and kind of give them a person to root for. Yeah, you know? And uh, because of this, Homer realizes that this is a scam that he could easily take advantage of and make a million dollars, so he puts a team together, much like in the Oceans movies, to basically write a young adult fantasy novel and basically sell it, and make a million dollars. And it's a really clever episode. I love all the references to the young adult novels that they do, like Twilight, Harry Potter, and uh, The Hunger Games, and The uh, D Divergent. And I love all the references to the Oceans movies. I mean, I really loved the Oceans movies. It was so disappointing when Bernie Mac and the... When Bernie Mac died, that basically confirmed that, like, there was never going to be an Ocean's 14, but I think there should be an Ocean's 14. And, more importantly, I really hope that Hollywood gets the fucking stick out of its ass and basically realizes that rebooting the Ocean's movies with an all-female cast wouldn't be a good idea. I mean... If you want to have a movie with women robbing a Las Vegas casino, let it then have a movie with women robbing a Las Vegas casino, but don't call it Oceans. Oh, don't call it Oceans 11. Because seriously, there's no point in doing that. If you're going to have a movie just to re just to basically have females doing the exact same idea that men have already done, then what's the po then it would be painfully transparent for you to literally name the movie the exact same thing as the movie that you're trying to rip off. It shows that you basically are doing this as a political statement and you really have no creativity whatsoever. Well, might as well go check on the stegosaurs and drop off all this stone. 
I really wonder how the Brackies and the Stegos are going to interact. Like, once I put them in the same pen together. I'm basically going to give them a chance to grow, because I feel like these animals are either going to be territorial or, sh or very timid whenever they're growing up, and then they might basically get scared of each other. But I feel like if they're fully grown, they're basically going to know that, like, eh, these guys aren't really a threat to me. So, just live and let live. <sighs> talked a lot about a lot of varying topics. I talked about what pissed me off, what doesn't piss me off, talked about Power Rangers, I've talked about The Simpsons, I've talked about Jurassic Park. Do I have a consistent theme that I want to stick to? Nope. This is what happens when you have unscripted comedy people. Comedy here, people. It, sometimes it just isn't comedy. Dirt. This is a box of dirt. Is the box of dirt going to help? If you don't want to, give it back. No. I got a box of dirt, I got a box of dirt, I got a box of dirt, and it's what's inside it. amazing. I already have more Dominican Amber than I will realistically will ever need, because basically speaking, you only need like three pieces. One for decoration and the other two, well, technically four. You need four, one for decoration, and three to make into Aqua Scarab Gems. The two Aqua Scarab Gems for the big aquatic monsters that you're going to have to use them on, and the third, the third one just for decoration. <laughs> Stegosaurus. And now, the prince. The dinosaur prince. I like the sound of that. You know how I was just talking about The Simpsons with the book job? Well, that episode encouraged me while also discouraging me at the same time. Because I've been wanting to become a writer for a long time now, and it just basically showed how annoying and, and tedious it can be being a writer, because it's the hardest part is getting started and sticking with it. Basically, everything that Lisa went through in that episode is something that I've went through myself, so it kind of discouraged me. So... And basically the idea that, like, the only way to actually pull it off is just to have a whole team of people dedicated to working with you to get to this to make this thing happen. So that right there is just kind of a, a discouraging thought. But anyways, what I am trying to say is that, ultimately speaking, I've wanted to write a young adult, a young adult fantasy novel myself. In fact, I've actually wanted to write several. I basically realized that because younger people have a much bigger suspension of disbelief than full-grown adults do, that it's just sort of easier to get teenagers to buy your story than adults, so that's the kind of the demographic that I'm going for. I don't want to deceive people, I'm not doing this for my own personal gain, I want people who will listen to a st I want people to legitimately listen to a story that I want to tell, for entertainment value, for nothing else. I mean, sure, I basically want to be successful, I want financial gain from this, but I also want the story, so basically speaking, I've scrapped a whole lot of story ideas that I've basically had for so many years. I mean, let's face it, after my mom died, the book series that we were working on together pretty much died with her, so... But basically speaking, I, um, uh, hmm... I got this new idea that I want to call the Dinosaur Prince. Now, it's not going to be some stupid sort of, like, kid show kind of thing, even though, like, I know there's a kid show out there with the same title, but basically speaking, I just, uh, I kind of have this really neat idea, and at the end of the day, isn't that all fiction needs? It's a is a neat idea to run with. Not necessarily a good idea, it could be a bad idea. That's the whole point. You gotta take your ideas, you gotta make them good. So, I have the idea, and I know what I want to do with it. All I need to do is just 
dedicate myself to writing it. And right now I've written an outline for the first installment of the series. Yeah, I do kind of want it to be a long-running saga and whatnot, so... I think that basically what I need to focus on is I'm taking that writing fiction class and most of the stuff, the class is somewhat tedious because I'm basically being told stuff that I already knew and this is stuff that I found out from my own experience trying to write this stuff so I feel like I should either be a professional at this class but I don't want to basically treat it like that because one, it would be a waste of money if I did and two, I basically want to keep an eye out for things that I don't know. So one of the lessons that we just went over is that kind of like the destination, the plot, the difference between a story and a plot is that a story is just a description of events, whereas the, the plot kind of has each event is affected with causality. Like a story basically tells you the queen died, the king died, and then the queen died. That's just a story right there, but a plot actually goes along the lines of the king had died and the queen died of heartache. So basically, it adds an emotional weight to the causality of what caused the queen's death. The king was probably killed in combat or maybe assassinated, and the queen was just so overcome with grief that she died not being able to live without her husband because... Well, let's face it, that's bullshit. Like, I, I highly doubt any queen is actually going to basically die without her husband being around. I honestly think that the queen is going to throw a huge friggin' party in celebration of her husband no longer being around. Because then, she has the power. At least until her oldest male- at least until the oldest male heir takes over. <laughs> So, basically speaking, I, uh, that's some, ultimately speaking, a character should be in a different place from where they started, and, hmm, ultimately speaking, I'm wondering, the main character from my Dinosaur Prince idea, what would his character arc essentially be? So, I'm guessing, from what I've established and what I want to happen in the novel is that the beginning of the novel starts out that he revealing that he has a very strenuous relationship with his mom because he thinks that his mom is an overbearing control freak who is manipulating everything in his life even to the point of sabotaging his college interviews and she basically just she is doing all this from behind the scenes and she doesn't have any dignity to confront him she doesn't give him the dignity of confronting him about it because she's a workaholic and she's constantly busy with her job her profession that she barely gives him the time of day so but over the course of the novels he finds out exactly what is actually going on and that she basically has a much more political job than he understood before, so she ultimately has to have the kind of aloof relationship with him because she has to put her job first. There's so much more writing on this than just her personal career being fulfilled or just their family, like the entire state of like his demographic, so to speak, is at stake based on what what she is able to do for the community and whatnot. So Maybe that is where the difference is. Maybe that's where our his character like gets to a point where he does have a better relationship with his mom, but also the fact that he starts out kind of like a somewhat timid and passive guy who tries to be aggressive, only to get pushed or only just get knocked down because of it. But by the end of the movie, he uh, he definitely by the end of the story, he definitely gets his aggressive side and aggressive nature, and he's basically able to stand up for himself, and he's not going to be the weak social pariah that everyone believes him to be, so. And I've got a full chest here. Mmm, a full chest. Ooh la la. Well, I definitely don't think that I can keep this water spring, unless I build another pool down below, and basically have the waterfall fill into that. Yes! So, Allosaurus is basically going to have his own little grotto. <laughs> Man, I really hope that T-Rex doesn't find out about this, because I'm basically pimping... I'm just basically really pimping the Allosaurus pen here, giving it stuff like that the Tyrannosaurus is never going to have. 
Wee wee gee, pimpin is he. <laughs> ah, there we go. Man, I miss Death Strider so much. I remember, you remember when I talked to you guys about the diving suit that the Godzilla mod adds to this game? With Depth Strider, that suit would basically be the OP suit. It would basically be the OP armor. You know what, I honestly think that I should just be teleporting back and forth between the, the chest room and here. So, I'm going to take down my coordinates here. Fuck. Okay, negative 292, 57, 12. is going to be so jealous. Mm. But you know what? I just don't like this wall here, so I think I'm going to extend it. But I'll take care of that when I get back. And we're coming in on the 55 minute mark, and I can only record like an hour at maximum of these videos, so I think I'm just going to cut it out here. So Thank you all so much for watching, and keep me po updated as to whether or not you like this series, and I will continue doing it. If you guys want me to do anything else, maybe maybe if you guys want me to talk more, you guys want me to talk less, or if you guys want me to talk about a certain topic, just give me some ideas in the comment section down below, and I will talk to you guys in the next video. Bye!